Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me on this? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lake Travis Church of Christ. We're delighted that each and every one of you are here. Uh, we are blessed by your presence. And we pray that we will be a blessing to one another this morning. Uh, happy Father's Day to all those fathers out there. Um, all those grandfathers. All those who are fathers to our young children. Uh, we are just so grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, we've been grateful for the rain that we've been having. It's been good. It's replenished the earth. Uh, we've gotten rid of all of those allergies, except the mold is still hanging around. <laughs> but we've gotten rid of everything else. So it's good to see everybody here this morning. Um, Tanya and I, we're going to be married 25 years next month. Okay. 25 years. That's a blessing. Uh, she's stuck with me all this time, wherever we've gone, from Indiana to Salt Lake City to Southern California, and now here for the past nine years. 25 years, it goes by just like that. Those who have been married longer than that, or double that, or triple that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it takes work, uh, working with one another. Uh, and it reminds me of a story about this preacher who basically was speaking with one of his members. And he said, I heard that you're going to be married 50 years this coming next month. He said, that's right, I'm going to be married 50 years. He said, where do you plan on going from your 50? He said, well, I took her to Florida for our 25th. I'm thinking about going back and getting her for our 50. <laughs> that's bad. Isn't it? That's bad. Isn't it? No, uh, it's been a blessing. Ty and I, we've actually enjoyed the time that we've been married. And she's a great support to me. Uh, she always has been. Uh, prior to us getting married, we uh, courted, I would say, courted for almost three years. And uh, it was somewhat of a long distance relationship. Uh, we were in college together. She's from Michigan, I'm from Indiana. And we prayed before we got married and we said, God, use us in special ways. Wherever you take us, use us in special ways to get your will done. Use us, rather, through the good and through the bad. We want you to use us to get your will done. If you would, uh, if you can, please stand and hold up your Bibles and repeat everything. Hold, hold your Bibles up. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The Book of All Ages. The Book of All Ages. I will know it. I will believe it. I will live it. Have a seat. Sit down. All right. We have been uh, studying the. Uh, the entire Bible. We're in week number 12 of our study uh, this week, and uh, we're moving right along. This is a 31-week series, and we've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, it's been a collective effort uh, from our youngest classes all the way through adult classes to up here in the pulpit. We've been trying to keep everything together, and God has been with us throughout this study. In uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, the story of David and Bathsheba is well documented. We know that Bathsheba was married to Uriah the Hittite, one of David's warriors. And one afternoon uh, or one evening, the Bible says that David arose from his bed. And some translation says that he arose from his couch. And he went up on the rooftop. And I'm not exactly sure what David was doing up there on the rooftop. Uh, maybe he was just stretching his legs. Uh, he was getting a, a breath of fresh air. But the Bible says that he was up on the rooftop of the palace house and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And this was springtime. And uh, during that time at springtime is when kings went off to battle. But uh, David decided to stay behind. He was supposed to go off to battle like all other kings were, were supposed to do. But he sent Joab out to war, and he just stayed behind. And that's where temptation would eventually overtake him. And even though David knew that Bathsheba was married, now, 
David already had I mean, at least 20 women of his own. But he knew that Bathsheba was married, but he wanted her so badly that he sent for her and he slept with her. Bathsheba soon discovers that she's pregnant with David's child and David arranges for Uriah to be put on the front line to the battlefield. Uriah is killed and Bathsheba ends up marrying David. And David covers it up, if you recall that. <coughs> and later on we see where judgment was upon the house of David. Now David later confessed. He confessed of his sin and he repented of his wrongdoing. And God restored him. But because of his sin, there was this ripple effect throughout his life and throughout the kingdom. Let me repeat that. David sinned. He repented of his sin. God restored him. But because of his sin, there was consequences that went along with that sin. There was this ripple effect that David suffered the consequences of. Now, as Christians, we know that sin is sin is sin. God does not categorize sin, and neither should we. But depending on the sin, one of the things we have to understand is that our sins have different consequences. And David's sin led to some unwanted happenings in his life. Not only to him, but to the people around him. Do you know that some of the things that you do will affect the people around you? Did you know that? Whoever is the breadwinner of the house, would you know that you get a paycheck once a week or bi-weekly or monthly or however you get paid? And your responsibility is to take care of your family, to pay the bills. If that did not get done, then that would not be in proper order. Some of you have been saving for college funds for your children. And that will affect the different colleges that they may attend. And then how much money you're going to have to help them attend college. That's going to affect them. Conversations with your kids about Jesus Christ and doing God's will. That's going to affect their lives. <clears throat> David committed a sin. Now that I've given you some background information on the sins of the father. Let's dive in a little deeper into the story of a few of David's children. Let's skip over to 2 Samuel chapter 18. If you'll turn there with me. 2 Samuel chapter 18. This story has to do with Absalom. One of David's sons in his evil and wicked way. 2 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse number 29. The king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant in me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom said? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. Today's Lesson title is, Is Absalom Safe? Is Absalom Safe? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we once again come to your throne of grace, bowing our heads and humble hearts, Father, giving you all the glory and praise you so rightly, rightly deserve. 
Father, we are so thankful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us day in and day out of our lives. We thank you for the life that we've lived so far, the good and the bad. But Father, we pray and hope that we will be receptive to you and what your will is for our lives and be able to go out and share the good news with those who don't yet know you. Father, we are mindful of all the dreaded things that have happened throughout our country and throughout, throughout our world. And Father, we pray that you will watch over that and, and help those situations and make good come out of all those things like we know that you will. Father, we are thankful for the fathers that are present here in the world over. We thank you for their leadership and for what they've done to rear their children, to be an example to others around them. Father, we're just so thankful. We love you so much, Father. We lift you up. We give you all the glory and praise. And the truth is, Father, we couldn't do it without you anyway. We offer this prayer to you. In Christ's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Just a little history. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we know that Nathan confronts David. He rebukes David and because of David's sin. In chapter 13, we have Absalom, the son of David, uh, 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 kills Amnon, uh, David's other son, for raping his sister Tamar. In chapter 14, David, David forgives Absalom. And Absalom bows down before him with his face to the ground, and David kisses him. In chapter 15, Absalom uh, rebels against David, and David flees to Jerusalem. In chapter 16, Absalom takes over Jerusalem. In chapter 17, Absalom plans to attack his father. And then we come to chapter 18. We have the great battle between Absalom's army and David's army. And then we know that Absalom is killed. But before David is aware of his son's death, he asks the question, is Absalom safe? Is Absalom safe? Do you think that David already knew what that answer was? Maybe. Maybe not. I believe he was hoping Absalom was safe. You know, throughout scriptures, questions are asked by different persons for different reasons. And follow me for a moment. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. I might just want to show you a couple of things here. Genesis chapter 3. Questions are asked by different people for different reasons. Look here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree of the dark? This question was not designed to glean any specific information. Satan already knew what the answer was. But the question was designed to plant a seed of doubt and confusion in the mind of Eve. Follow me for a moment over to Genesis chapter 4. Turn with me page or two over. Genesis chapter 4. Let's look at verse number 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's king? God said, Where is your brother Cain? Again, this question was not designed to glean any information, any specific information, because God already knew what the answer was, right? But it was designed to bring to light to Cain, which God already knew. Come on, are you following me so far? Turn with me to Job chapter 14. And I'll be there in just a moment. Job chapter 14. It's Esther, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Job chapter 14. 
Verse number 14. If someone dies, will they, will they live again? That's another question. We know that according to the scripture, Job was a very patient man, right? His patience stands out because of his extreme suffering that he endured. He lost his, in, his children and all his wealth on the same day. He was covered with painful sores. His wife was a non-supportive wife. She was not encouraging. And his wife said in Job chapter 2 and verse number 9, curse God and die. Here in Job chapter 14, Job gives a very clear expression to his belief that after he lies down in the grave, God will call him out to life again. All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call and I will answer. You will long for the creature your hands have made. Surely when you count my steps, but not, my, not keep track of my sin, my offenses will be sealed up in a bag and you will cover my sin. Job already knew what the answer was. If someone dies, will I live again? One more that I'd like to show you. Turn over to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. In verse number 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? This was a great question to make us think. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? This question was to make us think forth rightly and straightly about the value of one human soul. Now we come to 2 Samuel chapter 18, where we have David's question. Is the young man Absalom safe? The question is genuinely seeking information. Unlike all the other questions that we just read. This question comes from an anxious and agonized heart and hope for the best, even though he knew the odds were against him. In view of all the evil life that Absalom lived, David's deep concern for him can only be explained by one fact, and one fact only, that that was his son, and he was his father. What other reason could you conclude? A father's love for their child is undeniable. And sometimes, no matter how our children act or what they do, we will always love them. Amen? Absalom, though, was a murderer. He was disloyal. He conspired to kill his own father. He, when he came back to Jerusalem with his armies, he drove out his father out of the city. His father's army and Absalom army uh, meet up in the in war in battle in the force of Ephraim. They go to battle. And here we have a man who's a murderer. He betrayed his own father. He was willing to offer his own father up on an altar for his own selfish ambitions. Yet, when David's generals went out to meet Absalom's forces in battle, David utters these words in 2 Samuel chapter 18. He said, deal kindly with Absalom. Deal kindly with Absalom. He said, be gentle with Absalom for my sake. Be gentle with Absalom for my sake. Church, no matter how much wrong you've done in this life, maybe you've been uh, in an adulterous relationship, maybe you've been involved with pornography, maybe you've served prison time for crimes you've committed, maybe you lied on someone, maybe your belief is not what it should be, and maybe you're not living up to what God called you to be. Maybe you just can't seem to shake Satan and he seems to always be on your heels, tapping you on your shoulder. Maybe you've been weaving
evilly and you've been wobbly. You're hot for God one moment and then you're cold the next. Jesus says to his father, even though they keep messing up over and over again, even though they keep having their ups and they keep having their downs, Jesus says, Father, deal with them kindly. For they know not what they do. Church, Jesus is the great intercessor. He's the best attorney that you and I can ever have. Amen? Amen. He graduated from the school of all might with the highest distinction, and he received the crown of righteousness and the prince of peace. And if you and I are in Christ, if we are baptized believers, you may weevil and you may wobble, but guess what? You won't fall down because you're in Christ Jesus. Notice the words that David uses here. He says, for my sake. For my sake. Isn't that good news for us? That Jesus Christ says, for my sake. Father, for my sake. David knew Absalom didn't deserve kind treatment on his own. He didn't deserve it. But he said, for my sake. Jesus knows that we don't deserve to inherit righteousness. But he's saying to his father, for my sake. David wasn't the best example to Absalom and probably knew that he could have done better. But he said, for my sake. Jesus knows that none of us are righteous, no, not one. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he said, for my sake. David knew that Absalom killed his brother and he plotted to kill him. But for my sake, because I'm his father, I still care for him. And because of that, I want you to deal with him kindly. Brothers and sisters, no matter what we do, God is always wanting us to be close to him. He's always wanting us to grow closer to him. Church, this morning, I've got some good news for you, and I've got some bad news. The bad news is this, is that we're not right. And that true and perfect righteousness is not possible for us to attain by ourselves. That's the bad news. The standard is too high for us to reach. That's the bad news. But the good news is that true righteousness is attainable, it's reachable, it's possible through the cleansing of sin through the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Am I right about it? Amen. 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 We have no ability to achieve it even if you believe it by yourself. But as born again Christians, we possess the righteousness of Christ because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Amen? Amen. So that in him, we might become his righteousness. The righteousness of God the Father. David made a lot of mistakes in his life as king and as father. And he also suffered the consequences for his sins. And that's why you see this domino effect that occurred throughout his life. After getting another man's wife pregnant, Amnon fell in love with his sister Tamar and raped her. Absalom killed his brothers for his egregious acts. So David's concern about his son was a little bit too late. It was a little bit too late. It was tragic because at that very moment, the lifeless body of Absalom lay cold and mangled in a grave under a pile of stones in the woods of Ephraim. It was too late. Too late for Absalom. Absalom was, was not safe. To answer the question, Absalom was not safe. And David was too late to do anything about it. If you choose the wrong and not the right, God allows you to suffer the consequences. God didn't save Absalom from his bad choices. His heart wasn't right. In church, you can't save your children 
They have to choose to do the right themselves and obey God. However, we can teach them the Word of God. God, our Father, makes no mistakes. And guess what? He's given us the opportunity to get it right. God is never too late in offering His love and His grace. Am I like that song, Get Right Church and Let's Go Home? But you know what? There's an order of the way that God wants us to do things. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. Wives, love your husbands and be in subjection to them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Fathers, teach your children the ways of the Lord. This is the order. This is the plan that God has. And when these things are in order, God's will will get done. Guess what? They're going to get done anyway because he's God. Faith, repentance, and baptism places one into Christ. You've heard the word of God this morning. The question is, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the third day? That he arose, excuse me, died and then rose on the third day? Do you believe that he uh, was buried, buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose out of that? And now he sits at the right hand throne of God. And he's making constant intercessions for you and for me. His blood continues to cleanse. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you want to accept Him into your life today, if there's something we can do for you, if we can pray for you, why don't you come now as we together stand and sing? I'm here, the Savior say.